Okay. Well, greetings. greetings. It's good to see you all this morning. We welcome you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've come here as the body of Christ to celebrate. Just a couple announcements. One is to uh, reminder that we are, will be having baptisms on the 17th of this month. If you are interested in being baptized, you've not been baptized, you need to be baptized, see Pastor Tim and he'll uh, bring you in and talk with you and so on. Uh, the other is that we are excited when college students come and uh, not only to come to the service and to worship with us, but we have a special Sunday school class. If you are a college student and you didn't know that, well, right after this service, we have Sunday school, it'll be in room 20, back in the hallway. Somebody will direct you there if you need to know where that is. Hey, Pastor Dick, can I interject a little thing there too? Sure. The one thing I wanted to mention to that, the end of this month, we're in, we always encourage for the college age to obviously come, but also invite some friends. So we're actually going to have uh, little refreshments there as well at the end of the month. So um, feel free to invite your friends as well, but we, we, we encourage you to come and join us in room 20 uh, for Sunday School Hour. Amen. As our call to worship this morning, we have a couple of verses from Psalm 61, a Psalm of David, and David says this, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. For the end of the earth I call to you, from the end of the earth I call to you with my heart. Uh, it is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That rock we know, of course, is Jesus Christ. We've come here to worship, to celebrate the exalted Christ. So would you do that with me this morning? Would you stand in pre preparation to, to worship and greet one another as you do? Well, good morning, church. Welcome. We're gathered here to worship our Savior. Good morning, Craig. We're here to worship our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to gather with you. So let's start and begin with Sing to the King who is Coming to Reign. Satan 
Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. just sang, exalting the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come here into your presence this morning. There's only one reason for us to be here, not to socialize, yes, the fellowship, but to be drawn to you in worship and praise and adoration. And your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was made low for our sake, 
who bore our sins on His body on the cross, who was buried and resurrected victoriously, you receiving His payment for our sins. We've come this morning to exalt His name. For we know, Lord, that there will be a day when every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, the implications of that in the here and now are staggering, that we serve a risen Christ, that he is Lord and master of our life. He charts our course. He controls our life. He is our all in all. He is our everything. Father, we magnify the name of Christ. We ask you to help us this morning as we come to worship. Many of us come here with broken hearts, whether it be for a wayward spouse or a child, or maybe we're inflicted with some type of physical pain, and it is hard for us to concentrate and focus because of that. Father, would you visit us this morning? Would you fill our hearts so that we would be overflowing with the joy of the Lord in the midst of all circumstances? And Father, you, you, would hear, you would hear our prayer and that we would hear you speak to us. Father, as we take the time now to pause, I pray that you would prepare each one of our hearts to receive your word Brother, there is nothing greater in all the world that we can do at this moment than to receive the word of God. I pray that you would be with Pastor Tim as he articulates and proclaims and under the authority of your Holy Spirit that he would, he would thunder forth your word and that we would receive it, that we would trans, be transformed by it. Father, we thank you. We praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Again. I want to thank you for coming this morning and welcome you. They ask you to take time to take the black books and pass them down the aisle and you would sign in uh, your attendance here with us this morning. There is also a, uh, a sheet, a uh, sermon guide that you want to take. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we hope you feel welcome. We hope we've made you feel welcome this morning. They ask you to take a visitor card that's in that black book and you would take time to fill that out and put it in the offering plate as it goes by or in the Welcome Center when you leave, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Now we're going to continue in our worship before the message of God's Word. We're going to have an opportunity to give back to God a portion of what He's given to us in our tithes and offering. Then would you come forward, please? Thank you. Great. 
your sin and the peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand see you this morning. Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel this morning. We're taking a little break from our study in the Gospel of John. I told you at the very beginning of this year that we were going to do something a little different this year. Six times, maybe seven, if you count the introduction that I've already introduced to you on the first day of the year, I'd like to challenge us to be faithful in 2019. You see this banner back here? There's a banner in the foyer when you walk in the sanctuary, and I hope that you've got your little bookmark in your Bible this morning. We're going to be looking at growing in devotion today from 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17, particularly the life of King David, and in really in contrast to Saul. This is really a foundational message on what it means to be faithful. So you remember Matthew chapter 25, we looked at that passage on the first Sunday of the year where God had given certain well, the master had given certain servants talents, and the master is going to come again, and we're going to be required to give an account of our lives. And we want to hear that wonderful statement, well done, faithful servant. So we've entitled kind of this series, we'll just do four or five, well, six total messages in the whole year. I'm thinking maybe every other month on the first Sunday of the month, we will hit one of these little topics and work through it and uh, it's exciting this is an exciting passage I'm real excited about this particular passage for us because I really believe that it's foundational for us being faithful if you have a desire to be faithful to God then definitely this is required of you to have a heart after God so really that's the theme that we're going to be looking at this morning growing in devotion particularly asking God to give us a heart after him now we know something about the heart. What is the heart? We're not talking about the physical organ in our bodies that are pumping blood through our bodies, but we're talking about the, the, the uh, central system of our being, of our soul, this thing in our, 
and our souls called the heart that determines who we are. Out of the heart, things come out of our mouths, the scriptures say. Our lives are dictated by our hearts. You can tell someone, you look at someone, you say, well, he's got a good heart or he's got a bad heart. Just by what comes out of his mouth or his, his life, the way he lives his life. And so we want to, I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. We're going to jump around a little bit in 1 Samuel just a little bit. But if you'd like to turn your Bibles there, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13, page 235 in your pew Bibles. But I want to ask you this morning as we, we think and we begin this morning, do you have a heart after God? Do you have a heart after God? Would you be able to say that the Holy Spirit has transformed your heart? that you have a desire to obey the Lord, you have a desire to worship the Lord, you have a desire to please the Lord. This is not something that the world has. This is a result of our conversion. This is the result of being born again. If you're a Christian, then you ought to have a new heart, a heart like David's. It was the Bible says we're going to read here. It was a man after my own heart. Two, two times in Scripture, 1 Samuel uh, 13 speaks of that, and there's also Acts chapter 13 as well. We'll go to those passages. I'll never forget when I was just about, oh, 15 or so, I was a young, young man. I remember exactly where I was sitting at my little church there in Guyman, Oklahoma. And I'd been a Christian for a while, uh, but I remember sitting about right where Matt Blackton is, right there. I, I could go back to the very spot. Now, this may or may not have happened to you, and that's not the point that I'm trying to say. But I just remember that spot where I said, Lord, I want to give you all of my heart. I want all of my life to be lived for you. That was a transforming day for me that I made a decision to do some things in my life in order to give all of my heart to him. I wanted to be a person who God looked at and said, I, that man is a man that, I, that has a heart after me. That's exactly what I wanted. And so this is a very foundational message for us to think about this morning, asking ourselves, do we have a heart after God? You know, Pastor Dick and I talk all the time about, you know, doing counseling. People come in all the time. And, you know, it's interesting. You can see those people who have really have a heart for God and those who don't have a heart for God. It's pretty clear. So we want to look at this this morning. We want to look at this, ask some questions of this text and this idea. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you don't have a pew Bible, grab a Bible. We're going to read verses 1 down through verse 13 together. At Ebenezer, we like to stand in honor of God's Word. So won't you stand with me? Let's read this particular story. This is the particular story where David's being anointed as king. Saul has been king for several years. He is not a good king. In fact, we're going to look at some contrasts. Saul's heart is not after the Lord. And David's heart is after the Lord. So Samuel calls for Jesse and his sons, and he anoints David here in this wonderful passage. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how, shall, how can I go? If Saul hears, he will kill me. That tells us something about Saul's heart as well. Samuel's the great prophet of God. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him who I, whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him him trembling and said you come peaceably and he said peaceably i have come to sacrifice to the lord consecrate yourselves and come to me to the sacrifice and he consecrated jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice when they came he looked on elib this is the oldest son and samuel thought surely the lord's anointed is before him but the lord said to samuel now look at this passage do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Ab Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. 
Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was a Rudy, and had he was Rudy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the hoil, horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you. We pray now, Father, that you would help us to grow in our devotion to you. Father, my prayer is that all of us in this room have hearts after you. Lord, man truly does look on the outward appearance, but you look at the heart. The thing that matters most is our heart. What is our heart like? Lord, help us this morning. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that yet doesn't have a heart after you, I pray that you would do that work, that saving work in their hearts and their lives. Lord, maybe there's some here that they, they have been saved. They're truly a child of God, but their hearts have wandered and strayed away. Lord, how are we going to be faithful? How are we going to be faithful to you if our hearts, if we don't guard our hearts, if we don't allow our hearts to be in full devotion to you? Oh Lord, so help us. Help us now. Bless our study. May it touch our hearts and change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Keep your Bibles open there to 1 Samuel. In fact, we're going to go back and forth. Why don't you go back just for a second to chapter 13. We'll go back to chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13, here in just a little bit. I want to show you one thing here. Saul has uh, disobeyed the Lord, and particularly verse 14. The Lord, Samuel tells Saul, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. We could also go to Acts chapter 13, verse 22 where the Apostle Paul is speaking here and giving a little history. And he says that the Lord spoke up and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all, who will do all my will. Here's what it is in a nutshell of what it means to have a heart after God. It means that you're willing to do whatever the will of God is. I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to, I love God so much. I'm willing to obey. In fact, that's the big contrast between Saul and King David in these passages. Saul, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, Saul didn't have a heart to obey God, but David did. David did. Now, it's interesting, and I want to say this right at the beginning. This particular passage speaks about David. You say, well, how old is David? Well, I think David here, scholars believe David may be 15, 16, 17 years old. And yet, it says that God said of him, he, he was a young man with a heart after God. Now, how many young people, and I want to say this right off the bat, how many young people here this morning, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, we could say of them, they have a heart after God. You know, we give teenagers an excuse today, oh, they're going to rebel, they're going to go off and do what they're going to do, let them do what they want to do. I think that is a poor, those are poor words of God's people. Because if God has the young person's heart, even at a young age, they should be willing and ready to follow the Lord and love Him and adore Him with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen, church? We should foster this atmosphere where we're encouraging young people, don't follow the ways of the world. Follow the Lord. Allow your heart to be in love with the Lord. David was... God's choice over Saul because he had a heart after the Lord. You can kind of see David out in the fields, can't you? Taking care of his sheep. What's he doing out there? He's probably reading, reading his, his, the word that he had, praying, meditating, playing his harp, singing unto the Lord, developing this heart after God. Now, I want us to look at three things. For, very practical this morning, very practical. Three things. What matters most, number one, is your heart. What matters most is your heart. And we see that right here in the text that we read this morning. Samuel is going to anoint a, a new king. Saul has been king for quite some time. And he was uh, anointed king, you'll remember, because the children of Israel demanded of God to have a king. 
And if you remember, Saul was a very handsome man back in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2 tells us something about him. He was a, a man, handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than Saul. For from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. In fact, the people were enamored with Saul. They were enamored with him. In fact, they chose him. Saul was the people's selection. And yet Saul pro proved not to have a heart after what God's will was. And so Saul was this man with, the, with a great outward appearance. But if you'll notice again back in chapter 16, we just read it, as Samuel goes to Jesse and asks, has all the sons come before him, even Samuel was was a little bit enamored with the oldest son and himself said, surely this is the one, right? This uh, Elab, Elab, when he came, surely the anointed, Lord's anointed is before him. But God had to remind Samuel, the prophet. Now who's Samuel? He's the great prophet. He's one of the first great prophets that God would speak to Samuel. Samuel would speak to the people. And God had to remind Samuel of this great truth. Two things. 1 Samuel 16, 7, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So here's the first thing. Man looks at the outward appearance. Man looks at the outward appearance. Even when we look at ourselves, we're so consumed in a culture where everyone is so consumed with the outward appearance. It doesn't take long. Go to the grocery store, look at the magazine racks, and everything is about what you look like on the outside. Young ladies, don't, don't fall into this trap. Uh, your, your, your worth is not based upon what you look like on the outside. Same with you young men. Our worth is not based upon what's on the outside. This is just a shell. This really doesn't matter. What matters most is what is on the inside. On the inside of our heart. And God knows this heart. The thing that, that makes us do what we do. The thing that makes us say what we say. The thing that makes us live what we live. The thing that makes us treat others the way we treat others. It's this heart inside of us. God's going to change your heart if you allow Him. So man looks at the outward appearance. We have a tendency to do that, don't we? We look at the outside. We look at the way people are dressed. We look at the way people look. And yet what God cares about most is on the inside. What is on the inside of you, in your heart. Well, David's life is certainly a portrait, a portrait of success and failure, but here we see uh, very clearly that David is a young man who set his heart after God. Now, Listen, God knows what's inside your heart. You, you do as well. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians said we don't even know the own motivation of our heart. God knows our own motivation. Sometimes we don't know what's on our heart, but we know what's there. He sees it. He sees that. He sees the innermost lust of our heart. He sees the anger in our heart. He sees the bitterness in our heart. He sees the love for others in our heart. He sees when we sing, whether our lips, we're singing with our lips and whether our heart is far from God. He sees all of that. We can't fool him. You might be able to fool your mom and dad. You might be able to fool your spouse. But you can't fool God. He knows. and He sees into the recesses of your being. So this is what matters most. Now I want to move secondly. And we're going to spend most of the time right here in the second and third point. But let me ask you this question. This is an important question. What does, it, what does a heart after God look like? What does it look like? And I want to give you four characteristics that I think that I see in David's life right here in this passage, chapter 16, 17, also the whole book of Psalms. We could go through the whole book of Psalms and we could see uh, this heart of David being poured out. And we'll read some of those this morning. But chapter 16 and 17 is this anointing of David. And he's anointed. Uh, we didn't read all of the story, but you, you know the rest of the story if you've been around church very long. Um, chapter 17 is that passage where David goes and you remember he's out in the field and his dad calls him and says, I want you to take some lunch to your brothers. They're fighting the Philistines. And so David goes and takes lunch to his brothers and checks upon them. And guess what he finds out? That the Philistines are fighting the Israelites and the Philistines are on one side of the mountain. The Israelites are on the other side of the mountain. There's this big giant, nine foot giant named Goliath that is... Uh, coming out and defying the, the armies of the living God. And David runs up and he hears about it. 
And we see chapter 17, we see some great things about King, about David here in this passage as well. All right, so let me give you four things. We'll kind of go, we're going to go back a little bit, we're going to go forward a little bit in the book of Samuel. And I want to show you four characteristics. What does it look like to have a heart after God? And as we look at these four characteristics, start asking yourself this question, does this describe me? Number one, faith. It means having an absolute trust in God. An absolute trust in God. Now if we go back to chapter 13, we can see a great contrast with David. Chapter 13, Saul, and we won't look at the whole story, but you can go back and look at it. Saul is about to fight the Philistines. And uh, he is going to make a sacrifice. In fact, he's called Samuel to come make a sacrifice. He's going to wait seven days for the appropriate time for Samuel to come and make a sacrifice so that he would have the favor of God upon him and the armies of, of Israel so they can go fight the, fight the Philistines. But for some reason, Samuel in chapter 13 doesn't show up on time. And so what does Saul do? Well, Saul panics. Saul has this idea of, well, I just need to do something really quick. I just need to do something really quick. I need to get this done. And so what does Saul do? He makes the sacrifice instead of Samuel. He goes ahead and does it. And in verse 12 of chapter 13, we see Saul's heart. Well, verse 11, Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, Well, when I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, yeah, right, forced himself, I think that's irony here, or sarcasm, and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, look at this, you have done foolishly, here it is, for you have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel. And it's out of that context that he says, now the kingdom shall not, your kingdom shall not continue, but the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. To do what? To do all that the Lord had commanded him. You've not kept what the Lord commanded. So Saul was a man who didn't have faith. He wasn't trusting God. He panicked in the midst of his trial, in the midst of his tribulation. He's going to fight the Philistines. He's worried that he doesn't have the favor of God, so instead of allowing Samuel, who was supposed to do the sacrifice, Saul took it upon himself. This was a disobedience, a clear disobedience to God. And instead of trusting God, Saul cowered to the moment. Now, this is in total contrast to King David. Now go back to chapter 17. We see very clearly in chapter 17, this is not the way David acted. In fact, when David comes upon the, the armies of Israel and, and Goliath is coming out to fight them, David comes upon the scene. And notice, just quickly, notice verse 37 of chapter 17. I'm showing you this contrast, Saul and David. Look at chapter 17, verse 37. When David comes upon the, the brothers and to go fight, notice what David says. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Of course, you know the rest of the story. Look down at verse 45. He gets the stones out of the, out of the brook, chose uh, five smooth stones, went and met Goliath. And Goliath, of course, begins to mock David, mock him, make fun of him. And, and the God of Israel. And notice what, God, what David says in verse 45. This is glorious. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all of the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all of this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword, not with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Now notice the contrast between Saul and David. Saul's very worried. I've got to do this. I've got to get this done. David says, I'm trusting in God. I'm trusting with faith in my God. There is an un, un, moving 
absolute trust in the heart of David. I mean, think he says to Saul, you know, listen, I, I killed the bear, I killed the lion with my own hands. God can deliver this, this Goliath, this giant into to my hands by the hand of the Lord. You hear the trust in David? He's just a boy. He's just a boy. And yet he is a man after God's own heart. Psalm chapter 25, chapter 27. Great, most of the, many of the Psalms were written by David. Listen to what David said in Psalm 25, verse 1. To you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be put to shame. Let my, let my enemies exalt over me. Chapter 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light. Remember this? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Now this is key in our hearts. To have a heart after God means that we trust Him. It means that we don't tremble at this world. It means that we don't fear when things get difficult. When things and circumstances and life looks impossible. Did it look impossible for David? Did it look impossible for the Israelites when they faced the giant? You bet it did. And yet David says, I trust in my God. I trust in Him. This is at the very heart and the core of what it means to have a heart after God. It means that we trust Him. Secondly, number two, we're looking at four characteristics of what it means to have a heart after God. Number two, and this is key right here, having a heart of obedience or a heart of love for God and His Word. I initially just had the word love there, but I think it really is this word obedience. Now, one of the things that we see in contrast to David and Saul is this idea of obeying the word of the Lord. Now, there's another illustration of Saul's failure to obey God. If you look back at chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15, I want you to turn your Bibles back. I want to just show you Saul, and we see the great contrast between Saul and David. Chapter 15, verse, really the whole chapter, Saul was supposed to destroy the Amalekites, and particularly he was to kill the king, Agag. He was to destroy all of uh, the animals, the, the people, all the animals. And yet when everything is said and done, Saul doesn't obey. He thinks he does. He makes excuses for himself. Samuel comes and confronts him. Verse 11 Look at verse 10 of chapter 15. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king. Notice this, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. He has not performed my commandments. Of course, Samuel's angry, cries out to the Lord, and he goes and he confronts Samuel. Verse 13, Samuel came to Saul. Saul said to him, Blessed Be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Notice he makes a, he thinks he's obeyed the Lord. Samuel said, Then what is the bleeding of this sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, Well, they, notice the excuses that he made. They, speaking about the people that brought them from the Amalekites, or the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. We're going to, we're going to use this to sacrifice to God and the rest we've devoted destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And then Samuel begins to tell him, you are little in your own eyes. Are you not the head of the tribe of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Notice verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce, notice this word, pounce upon the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people, again, he makes an excuse for them, but the people took on spoil, sheep and the oxen, the best things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord. Now notice verse 22. Here's what God says to Saul. This is key. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God has also rejected you from being king. Wow. 
So Saul doesn't obey God. Saul doesn't obey God. And yet David is a man who obeys the Lord. He obeys the Lord. We don't have time to look at all the different places, but Psalm chapter 119 is a great passage. Of course, Acts 13, verse 22, the Apostle Paul tells us that David was this, a man after my own heart who would do all of my will. Psalm 119 is a great passage that describes David's heart. David, you remember here he said, Blessed are those who keep his statutes, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. Verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from, my, from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. And we could go to passage after passage after passage. But listen, here we're going to get to the application in just a minute. But here's what a heart after God looks like. They trust God. They obey God. Obey His word. They have a love. A love. Let me ask you, do you have a love for the Word of God? Do you have a desire to obey the Word of God? John chapter 14, Jesus said, did He not? Those who love Me will keep My commandments. There's a third characteristic. Not just trust or faith and love and obedience, but third, worship. Worship, it means having a heart of praise and gratitude to God in all things. Now, we don't know this for sure, but I'm considering that David is probably out in the fields worshiping and praising God, spending time giving thanks to God. Psalm 100 is that great passage where David says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Give praise to him. We could list place after place after place, but isn't this not a... A heart after God is a heart that worships. John chapter 4, verse, you remember verse 23 and 24, there is, God is seeking true worshipers who do what? Who worship Him in truth and in spirit. David was a true worshiper who worshiped Him with all of his life. And then fourth, number four, four characteristics. I'm trying to get through these quickly so we can get to the, the, the third point and some of the application, but we can't skip over this one. Because we know David wasn't a perfect man, was he? But here's the fourth point, repentance. Repentance. You know, it's interesting, when you look at Saul's life, when Samuel comes, he makes excuses for his sin. But David, when he is confronted by the prophet Nathan, you'll remember King David sinned against the Lord. We won't <clears throat> look at that story, but you can go read it in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, when David sinned with Bathsheba, you remember he committed murder, he committed, he committed adultery, lying, and murder against the Lord. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, it says of, of uh, David, when Nathan came, he says, listen to this, I have sinned of the Lord. Now, all those first three are important. We're, we, we hope to have a heart of faith. We hope to have a, a heart of obedience. We hope to have a heart of praise. But isn't it true of all of us, just like David, that we're going to fall into sin? And when we fall into sin, when we, when we trip along the way, our response will tell us whether or not we truly have a heart after God. Do we repent of that sin? Do we turn from that sin? Nathan said to David, you're the man. You remember that? You're the man. <clears throat> the Lord has put you away put away your sin after David repented of his sin Nathan said the Lord has put away your sin you shall not die and of course Psalm 51 is the great response of King David after he sinned with Bathsheba you remember he said against you and you alone have I sinned Lord he asked the Lord to wash him Psalm 51 is the response David's response after sinning with Bathsheba listen to his repentance I'll read just a little bit of it have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned, God, and done what is evil in your sight. And the whole passage is just a passage of repentance. Falling on his face before God, asking God to forgive him for the sin that he committed against God. Now, I would say those are the four major, major themes. When you want to ask, what does it look like to have a heart after God? 
Those are the four big issues. Do you, do you have a heart that trusts God? It's worked out in your own life. Do you have a heart that desires to obey God? Do you have a heart that worships God? And when you sin, do you say, well, I just got caught? Or do you fall on your face before the Lord and ask Him to forgive you? This is truly a heart of, that worships God. Now, let me move to the third point, And we'll just do this briefly. But what, how do I develop a heart after God? If, if your heart, if you want a heart like David's, if you want a heart after the Lord's heart, how would you develop this? Well, let me give you four practical things to think about. I want you to ask yourself if you're doing these. Number one, make sure, that, first of all, that you're truly converted. Truly converted. We need to say this right off the, off the bat here. Having a heart after God doesn't mean that you're just working harder. It doesn't mean that you're just trying harder or somehow that David was approved because of his deeds. No, it wasn't his deeds. In fact, the key is that David was converted. In fact, at the end of this little passage that we read, <clears throat> you'll remember that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. In chapter 16, verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. It says the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. From that day forward. Now for us as New Testament covenant believers, we understand this, that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. To have a heart after God, first and foremost, means that you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. John chapter 3, you must be born again. Verse 3, you must be born again. That is, is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You must have the Holy Spirit in you. Romans chapter 8, those who do not have the Spirit of God are not of God. So we're not saying just improve your works. We're saying, are you converted? Have you been born again? Has the Spirit of God come upon you? And are you walking in the Spirit? Which begs the question, I'm not going to entertain this very long, but was Saul really converted? Was he really converted? There's a great debate about that. Certainly open to debate. I don't know if we'll ever know for sure. But it looks like Saul seems to be this example of the seed sown among the thorny grounds which got choked out and didn't bear fruit into eternal life. We don't know that for sure. We could go back and look at Saul's life. Saul had some sort of dramatic spiritual experience where God, if you will, changed his heart and the Spirit of God came upon him mightily and he prophesied. That was in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. David didn't have any experience like that at all. At least there's nothing recorded for us. But when you look at both of their lives, subsequently to that experience, Saul went in a totally opposite direction than David. Saul lived according to himself. He, his course of life was marked by self-seeking and partial obedience, kind of over this veneer of spirituality. But David's heart was different. David, even though he had sin, he sinned, he had a heart to follow the Lord, and he repented of his sin, and he followed God two different tracks all together. If you're truly converted, you'll have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. And you must be Spirit-led. I don't have time to dive into Galatians chapter 5, but that's really the command. Walk not by the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit lives in you. So here's the first part of having a heart that is like God. You must, first of all, be converted. If you're not converted... Scripture is very clear. Call in the name of the Lord Jesus. He will save you. And at that moment, you will enter into the new covenant and you will receive the Holy Spirit and your heart will be changed. Just like the covenant promise, the Hebrews chapter 8 speaks about the, the covenant promise of Jeremiah 31 that God will give you a new heart. See, it's not about revising your old heart. It's about receiving a new heart. A new one. So here's the first thing. Number one, make sure you're converted. Make sure that... God has given you a new heart. Secondly, if you have that new heart, here's the practical application for us as believers. Be disciplined to spend time alone with God and His people. Be disciplined to spend time alone. I, I shouldn't shortchange this. There's no way possible that you're going to have a heart after God if you are not spending time alone with the Lord in His Word. Three things. Learn to read. Learn to read your Bible. 
Learn to read it. Soak it in. That's why in my Bible, and I try to encourage you to have your Bible reading plan. I've got my Bible reading plan right here in my Bible. And yeah, I've missed a few. I'm trying to get caught up, but I'm, I'm trying to be faithful to read my Bible every day. Spending time with God, soaking it up, soaking it up. Second, learn to pray. <clears throat> Spend time with God alone. Spend time with God alone. Praying. And then third, learn to worship privately. Privately and corporately. Let me ask you, do you worship God privately? In your time alone with God, singing songs to God. Asking God to to soften your heart toward Him. So you read the Word, you pray, you sing a little bit, you're in devotion to God. I'm growing in my devotion to God on a daily basis. Let me just say this. There is no substitute for your heart except to have a daily time alone with God. This is very, very fundamental. Very fundamental. It's like we're going back to the basics a little bit here. But oh, David said, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary corporately, beholding your power and glory. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see, this was his heart. This was David's heart. Third. And this is where I want to spend a little time. Third, number three. Be rigorously obedient to God even in the small things. Even in the small things. You set out saying, God, I'm going to obey you. And you think about King David in this story. He's out guarding his sheep. Why is he out there? Well, his father said, go out there. Well, that's not a very prestigious job. His brothers are out at war, but David is there. In fact, when Samuel comes to anoint, guess where David is? Obeying his father, doing what his father said. Well, that's no fun, but that's where he was. A little thing, a little thing, right? But I think that's important because uh, God sees faithfulness in the little things. Of course, when Jesse said, go, David, go and, and take food to your brothers, check on them. He got, a, he got someone to watch over his, his sheep, chapter 17, verse 20. And he went and he checked on his brothers. He did what his father said. He obeyed. He obeyed. Even in chapter 17, verse 26, when his brothers criticized him, David held his tongue. He held his tongue. He, I think he was a young man desiring to obey the Lord, to follow him. So let me, a couple of things. Let's think about this for, for, as far as obedience goes for you. I have about five or six illustrations here. What about you children? All the children in the room. Do you want a heart after God? Here's the first place where it begins. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Now, all the children, look at me. All the children in the room, look at me. Do you have a heart to obey your parents? Why don't you pray right now, Lord, in your heart, Lord, help me to obey my parents. It begins now. Parents, you need to remind your children of this. Right now, that God would shape their heart. Children, Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Listen, if you can't honor your father and mother, if you can't obey your father and mother, how are you going to obey God? So it begins there. Shaping your heart not to be rebellious against the Lord. Others, I've got others down here. What about husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Yeah, those are commands. But let me ask you, is that in your heart, husbands? Love your wife. Even in the small things. This is not a small thing. This is a pretty big thing. But are you willing to do that? Wives, submit to your husbands. This is what the Lord says to us. What about dating an unbeliever? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. You know, find out what the Lord says. Are you going to obey what the Lord says? Or are you going to do what you want? What about in regards to your sexuality? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So I've, put, I've desired in my heart, I've said in my heart, 
I'm going to obey my parents. I'm going to abstain from things that, God, you don't want in my life. See, if you're unwilling to do that, how can you say you have a heart after God? Quit saying you have a heart after God if you're not willing to do those things. With your tongue, do not let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth, Ephesians 4, 29. The music you listen to. How about singing in general? Singing, when we sing here this morning, well, I don't like that song. I don't like that song. I don't like the way they're playing it. I don't like the way it's organized. I don't like it. I'm not going to sing it. No, you know what? I made a deci- decision in my life. Even if I don't like the song, I'm going to sing it as unto the Lord. I don't care the style. I don't care the song itself. If it sings praises to God, I'm going to sing praises to the Lord. I determined that in my heart. I've determined that. What about the activities you participate in? Ephesians 5, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. All right, so here, this is very important. Practically, how do you develop a heart? You obey God in even the small things and the big things. You say, God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. And then last, be truly repentant when you sin against the Lord. Be truly repentant when you sin against the Lord. And we're going to sin. We're going to mess up. We're going to fail. We're not going to do what we've, we need to do. But when we fail, we get on our face before God and we say, God, please forgive me. I've sinned. I want a heart after you. I want to follow you. I want to grow in my devotion to you. Help me, oh God, to make a change in my life. Help me to have a desire to obey you. Maybe some of you this morning, you don't have a desire to obey God. Won't you pray a prayer? God, give me a desire to obey your word. I may not understand it, but Lord, help me. Help me to submit to it, even when I don't understand it. Oh, to have a heart after God. See how practical this is this morning? In 2019, we want to be a people who are faithful to God. And it begins right here with having a heart that desires to please the Lord more than anything. Let me ask you, do you have a heart after God? Would God look in your heart and say, you know what, that old boy, that old girl, man, they love me and they love my word. Would they say that about you? Would God say that about you? Maybe some here this morning need to ask God to forgive you. You've strayed from the Lord. You know, that's that's the good news of the gospel. The Lord Jesus has forgiven us on the cross for all of our sins. If you're here this morning and your heart is strayed from the Lord, you can come back to Him. If you hear His voice this morning, if He's knocking on your heart and you hear His voice, won't you come back to Him? Won't you repent like David did and fall on your face and say, God, I've turned from You. I've gone astray from You. Oh Lord, I want to have a heart after You. Won't you pray that and ask that? For some of you young people in the room, This is a very crucial time in your life. It's a crossroads. It's a fork in the road. Will I follow God or will I follow my own path? Your choice. There's a way that seems right unto man and at the end leads to death. It's a narrow path to walk the path of God, but He will help you. Bow your heads with me this morning. Let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's table this morning. If you're a Christian this morning, we invite you to come to the Lord's table. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across the room as the men who are going to help me this morning with the Lord's table will step forward. We want to take just a moment and examine our hearts. The book of Corinthians tells us to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. We come to this Lord's table as a reminder of what Christ has done for us, causing us to be born again. His body was broken. His blood was spilled out on our behalf. We might have a new heart. You see, this whole idea of a new heart is not work a little harder. We come to the Lord's table and we're reminded that Jesus on the cross provided the way of salvation so that we can have a new heart. A new heart. If you've been given a new heart and you're a Christian this morning, you're welcome to participate in the Lord's table. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you refrain from participating. And for all of us who are Christians, The scripture says not to come to this table unworthily, which means that we're to come and examine ourselves and ask ourselves whether are we understanding the work of Christ? Is there any sins that we need to confess? 
Do I have sin against a brother that I need to get right with? I think this is an important time for the church to be holy, cleansed, be cleansed of our daily sin. Why don't you ask the Lord to wash you, cleanse you? Ask the Lord to renew your heart right now as we remember all that Christ has done for us. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time as the church gathers. We're thankful that the new covenant has given us a new heart. It's not by works, not by works, but by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the work of Jesus on the cross. Thank you that he went to the cross. He died, was buried, rose again on the third day. Because of that, we have entered into this new covenant. Our hearts have been changed. We are your people. We are your sheep, and we hear your voice, and we follow you. Not perfectly, not perfectly, but Father, we've been transformed by the blood of Christ. Lord, may we remember this as we participate in remembering the death of our Savior this morning. Oh, we celebrate his death and resurrection. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come.
the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Bible says he took bread and he broke it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. On the first Sunday of the month, we take up a little extra offering, a benevolent offering to help those in our church who are hurting, those in our community who are also hurting as a witness to them of the good news of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to give a little extra to the benevolent offering, you can do so at this time. As we pass around the plate, let's stand together and sing, You Are My Vision. vision. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. 
this is our vision. We love him. Go and do it. Lord bless you. Have a great week.